Hello and welcome to IPAS final webinar of 2021. Today's webinar discusses the topic of mute modification, tackling the taboos. I am Brian Parker, IPAS Head of Safety and Technical, and today it's my pleasure to be your host. Now we have over 400 legislations from nearly 50 countries registered today, so really big thank you and hello to all of you from wherever you are joining us from today. We have simultaneous translations of the webinar being carried out into French, Spanish, German, Dutch, Italian, Portuguese, Chinese, and Korean. Before we start, I would like to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, Skyjack and Hinaware, as with their support, they make these webinars possible for you all. So, tackling the taboos. Modifying machines can and often is controversial. It can be complex with many safety implications and is often carried out without realizing a modification that actually has been made. But let's face it, they can be carried out with good intentions, but sometimes the results can be serious or costly. I hope today our speakers can give you some insight from their own experiences and the sectors they work in in the powered access industry. So now I'll give you some details of our speakers today. First up, you'll hear from IPAS North American Regional Manager, Tony Grote. He will give you an overview and the potential implications of the modification. He will be followed by Jim Waldron. Jim is the Product Safety Manager for Skyjack UK and Chairman of the IPAS Manufacturers Technical Committee. Jim will discuss the subject from the manufacturer's perspective. He will then be followed by Rob Cavallari, Rob is Safety Compliance Manager for Manlift in the Middle East. He's a member of the IPAF International Safety Committee and the IPAF Middle East Council. He will discuss modifications from a rental business's perspective. And then our final speaker will be TJ Lyons, who's based in America. TJ is a Safety Manager for DPA, DPR Construction in the United States. He will discuss this from a contractor's perspective. Now, there will be live Q&As during the web webinar, so please do ask your questions as we go along. Um, and the speakers um, and myself will endeavour to answer as many as we possibly can. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our sponsor video from Hinua.
Okay, thank you to Hinua, great video. Okay, um, there's a lot to get through today. So now I'd like to hand you over to Tony Groves. Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brian. As, as Brian mentioned, I'm the IPATH North America Manager, and I'm also Chairman of the ANSI A92.22 and Canadian CSA B354 Safe Use Standards. So a lot of the perspective that I'm going to bring to you is uh, through the eyes of someone who is very involved with industry standards. The ANSI A92 Mobile Elevated Work, if you go back, please, on the price slide, thank you. The uh, ANSI A92 mobile elevated work platform standards define a modification as any change to a mobile elevated work platform that affects the operation, stability, safety factors, rated load, or safety of the MUP in any way. I think we can all agree that in any way covers a lot of potential area where most changes to a MUP may be considered a machine modification. During the development of most of the, of the most recent US ANSI A92 MUP standards, the Bureau of Standards Review agreed with an appeal that the language in the standards that defines the requirement for modifications or additions may only be made with the permission of the manufacturer was a violation of commercial terms policies. And as such, the exclusive approval of the modification only from the MUP manufacturer is not permissible in an American national standard. It concluded that the standards could be adjusted to allow for experienced alternatives to perform modifications to a MUP, even if the manufacturer is still in existence. The standards state modification should be made only with the prior written permission of the manufacturer. Please note that the term should is to be understood as advisory or having the same effect as recommended opposed to shall as being mandatory. Further, standards add the requirement where the manufacturer or remanufacturer's approval cannot be obtained permission to perform modifications may be granted by an equivalent entity after analysis and approval of an engineer. Additionally, you must consider replacement parts require that they shall, which is must, be identical or equivalent to original MUP parts or components. So now that we uh, know what the MUP standard requirements for a modification are, let's look at what's happening in the marketplace. So the reality is MUPs are being modified. So let's examine why these well-designed and manufactured machines are undergoing a change in the marketplace. Let me establish that because you can do it, or because you believe you can design a better mousetrap, as this picture offers an example of one person's perceived improvements to his lawnmower, that neither is a valid reason to modify equipment, especially a machine intended to carry people at height. I personally have concluded that modifications occur in one of four classifications, unintended modifications, intended field modifications, assumed approved modifications when adding available accessories from a secondary market component supplier, or an approved modification by the MUP manufacturer. MUP design standards specify safety requirements and preventative measures, and the means for their verification for MUP's intended to position personnel at work at height. The design standard contains structural design calculations and stability criteria, construction, safety examinations, and tests that shall be applied before the MUP is first put into place. A modification must take place, must take into consideration the specific designs for each model MUP. Next, please. 
as unintended modifications can occur when a MUP owner makes a change to the MUP without consciously considering their actions are a machine modification that can in some manner affect the operation, stability, safety factors, rated loads, or safety of the MUP. I offer three examples of unintended modifications that I have observed. The first shows the replacement of a bolt on a guardrail system. You can see that a service technician goes to the tool crib and grabs a three eighths by two and a quarter inch bolt from the tool crib. However, the actual OEM part is three eighths by two inch. That extra quarter inch exposes the bolt further. The worker catches his ring on it and hurts his hand. This is an unintended, non-approved modification, something that the person did not intend. The second example is an owner who replaces batteries. And in this case, not an identical or equivalent product to the OEM batteries. The replaced batteries have at least one deficiency in that they are not the same size and weight as the OEM battery that would be identical or equivalent. The weight of the batteries are a part of the design for the counterweight required in the stability of the MU. This is an unintended and non-approved modification. The third example is the replacement of a hook on a chain gate. Again, it is not an identical or equivalent to the changes that were required and it's the responsibility of the MUP owner, and it is unintended and unapproved. Next slide. More common are field modification by users. Too often, a user will make a modification with only consideration for the task they want to perform, without due consideration for the effects the changes have on the MUP's safe operation, stability, safety factors, rated load, or safe operation. These pictures offer a few examples. Note that only an owner, not someone renting equipment, may make a modification, and such modifications are subject to the applicable requirements defined in industry standards. A rental user must never make a modification. If we examine the picture on the top with the three question marks on it, here you see an addition that, that they added a work platform to the MUP. Uh, and you can see here, you have three occupants versus the allowed two. Workers are outside the work platform with no guardrail protection. The load is placed outside the design load area that was in the design criteria when the manufactured machine was designed. It's intended to carry uh, a specific weight and we'll be adding additional weight with glass that that platform is looking to install. And the list goes on as this modification is clearly well beyond the OEM initial design limits, the design standard requirements and the requirements for safe use. The fact that this or other non-approved modifications did not result in an accident is not proof that this is an acceptable or a safe modification, only that it was used that day without an incident. Just because a task was completed and no one was injured is not proof that a modification was safe or that one could be approved as compliant with the design requirements. Next slide, please. If you're a mute owner and see an advertisement for parts or accessories other than from your original manufacturer, you cannot assume that these are appropriate for use on your mute. Mute parts and components must be identical or equivalent to the original, and if doubt, obtain approval from the mute manufacturer or an equivalent entity. If not, you risk modifying the mute with something not approved for use on your particular model. You must have a mute manufacturer's approval or permission to perform a modification 
be granted by an equivalent entity after analysis and approval of an engineer. Next slide, please. Last for me, the clear approach to modifications allow on your MOOC obtain the part or component offered by the MOOC manufacturer. MOOC manufacturers design MOOCs for their intended purpose and are aware of how they are used in the marketplace. They offer many options and accessories to accommodate most known uses. MOOC owners and users must be aware of the availability of designs and approved options and accessories as your primary answer to your equipment needs and selection. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Tony. A great insight into some uh, examples of, of modifications that we see and are often sent to us at IPA. Um, following on now, I will now introduce Jim. Uh, Jim's going to talk from a manufacturer's perspective. So, Jim, over to you. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, as Brian mentioned before, my name is Jim Aldrin. I'm the product safety manager for Skyjack, and I'm the chairman of the IPAP Manufacturers Technical Committee. Uh, my objective today is to try to present the generic manufacturer's view in the broadest possible sense and trying to take on board that global perspective as well. Uh, Tony's done a great job in kind of laying the foundations, and a lot of my presentation will be reinforcing what Tony has already, uh, already talked about. But modifying MUPs and service is a tricky minefield to navigate, and we could take hours to discuss this topic. Um, and bear in mind, mine is one, one perspective on the, on the topic. What I want to do is just take a step back and again reinforce with Tony, um, why do we as manufacturers use standards to create the designs in the first instance? Uh, what are modifications and what the regulations and standards say about them? And then cycle back to some important takeaways and understanding responsibilities um, of modification. So standards are an important aspect um, of ensuring that products and services uh, are delivered that are consistent, they are predictable. So as a, as a consumer, you get the predictable behavior, you get the consistent output, you know what you're getting, that they meet the same safety standards, that they maintain the same level of compliance. Uh, and in some areas where those standards are set into law and into regulation, that you maintain a level of um, uh, compliance to the law as, as well. Um, and both standards and regulations ensure that when products are placed on the market, um, they've undergone the same level of analysis, test and certification through their development processes. And ultimately, as, a, as an end user, as a consumer, you get what you expect and you get what you pay for. So from a manufacturer's perspective, we have regulations and standards that define our design and test requirements. Um, and our machines are designed for very particular purposes and particular uses as laid out in those standards. Standards, for example, of EN 280 in Europe and the CA9220 that uh, Tony was referencing earlier and the CSA standards and Australian standards and, and others across the globe. These standards um, ensure that the machines and their associated documentation um, meet a set of requirements through the design and development process covering test validation and certification resulting in the product put onto the market. Once it's put onto the market, the transfer of responsibility moves across to the owner. And this is the area, this is the gray area that we're talking about today, which is where potential modification occurs. Um, and it's important to understand what is a modification, what could be the implications and impact of introducing a modification to a design new, um, and then who approves it. My next slide is a busy slide. I'm not looking for you to read it, um, but I just want to show that the standards across the globe um, all reference um, the importance of um, understanding modifications and ensuring that the right people are um, notified and aware and approving of the modification. As a manufacturer, we would always urge that you come to the OEM first, and I'll come to kind of why we think that um, through the next few slides. If I generalize across the globe, as this is an international presentation, generally the standards and regulations recognize that the owners um, of the mute take responsibility for the machines and modifications that they make to their machines. 
uh, and also maintain that responsibility of keeping the machine safe to use. Generally, some standards require that the owner must not change uh, a MOOC without prior permission from the manufacturer, as Tony referenced, with other alternatives. And generally, as manufacturers, we recommend this in our manuals too. Modifications can accept operation stability, strength, safety, or performance, as already mentioned by Tony. And again, around the globe, some other references also identify whether there's new hazards, new risks, or new methods of control could constitute change as well. It's really important to understand what you're looking to implement as a, as a modification. And any modifications that are being sought to be made to the machine must meet the same standard as the original OEM, uh, original new. That includes the design checks, the manufacturing checks, the relevant test analysis and verification that was mentioned before. The modifications will likely impact as well, not just the machine, but its compliance documentation and its uh, literature as well. It's really important to understand that as well in the context of modification. And it's also important to recognize that the modifier may be assuming a level of responsibility of the entire machine, depending on the scale of the modification. But again, the person who's taking that responsibility is the owner. When they make modifications, they need to understand the potential consequences of those changes. Again, why we urge OEMs to be consulted as early as possible. But it's no one size fits all. It's no um, simple golden rivet to solve the answer of what's a modification and when and when not to get approval, because there are shades of modification. It's fair to say that if a, a MOOC is maintained in accordance with the OEM instructions, uh, approved parts are used, um, and you say within the guidance, it is not a modified MOOC. There are examples that Tony's already touched upon, and I'm reinforcing what Tony's already mentioned around intentional or unintentional modification of MOOCs, for example, the selection of an incorrect fault, the field repair, again, that was mentioned, for example, rewelding or wiring outside of the schematic definition. Additional accessories, so transferable um, pieces of equipment that change the uh, machine's properties. And then there's the physical modification on MOOCs baseline design. So this could be physical changes to the machine, uh, machine from something as simple as drilling a hole right the way up to some large significant changes of functionality of, of the MOOC. And it's complicated because you can't put these into really easy categories and say if A to B, because they all could work up and down the scale of complexity and up and down the scale of um, risk. So a hole in one location drilled is not the same as a hole being drilled in another location, just as a very simple example. Uh, and as products become more digital with more software, um, there are there's another layer of complexity with this picture as well. The software updates can also constitute modification and the use of that is particularly um, new and emerging into our marketplace. So why do we recommend that you engage in OEM? So a modifier may understand the modification and how it physically affects the parts that they're changing. They may understand the context and the context of the local change what the consequences are, but as Tony rightly highlighted before, the consequence of a change could not just affect the part, could not just affect the subsystem, but could affect some system level behaviors and properties of, of the new. And there's a non-exhaustive list. This could include weight, it could introduce integration issues, stability issues, uh, it could introduce um, compliance issues, bill of materials, etc. And the list goes on of things that Unless you know it, you may not pick it up. And a good example of a customer having a desire, um, they want somewhere to put their tools and materials, modification gets developed. Um, and you can see already that um, you know, their safety information has been obscured by the introduction of this particular mod. Then issues appear with the machine. And on inspection, we find that their screws have been put through the, uh, the mast and resulting in scoring and damage. Now, thankfully, there was no significant um, that there was no um, harm caused by this modification, but there was damage which was out of warranty and would need to be rectified at the cost of the modifier. And again, as Tony says, just because there was no injury does not make this an okay modification. And the reason we think it's important to come to OEMs is that it could have been avoided. There were solutions in place already that 
provide places to put tooling, provide places to put materials. So some of the modifications, I'm going to jump across these as I believe that um, Tony's done a good job of presenting some of these uh, types of scenarios already. Um, some of these may be approved, some may not be approved, but you can see the consequences and all of these would be constituted as modifications as they change the properties of, a, of the nuke itself. So the introduction of large flags, uh, the introduction of you know, uh, umbrellas, but on a particularly large boom and particularly high height, that would have a different consequence in diff than in, in lower conditions. Modification of railings to enable access and ease of access with outward opening gates, inward opening gates. Now, some of these modifications may be approved. They may be acceptable in certain markets, but they may not be appropriate in other markets. So it's very important to understand your local requirements, local regulation, and local um, uh, expectations. Because one modification may be allowable in one region, but not in the other. All modifications can change behavior, and they can change behavior um, and change the intended use of a mute to be outside of the scope. So the example with the basket there is very similar to Tony's um, applying a, a bracket outside. You don't have to physically modify the mute, but you can change the behavior of people by using the mute outside of its intended purpose. And all of these have potential consequences. The ladder being attached to a scissor um, platform, for example, creates a behavior that is unacceptable and is not approved. So the takeaway that I wanted to leave you with, um, the key implications about modifying, uh, modifying a new, is the unknown unknowns. If the modifier is not the OEM, they may not have all the information required to make a modification. They may not understand some of the system level issues. They may not have some of the lower level analysis enable, enabling them to make a, an informed decision of the modification they're intending to take out. Configuration and the impact on safety and compliance of modification. It's really important to understand the consequences and all the consequences. And a competent organization worked hard to understand the consequence of change through risk assessment. The invalidation of a warranty is also worth noting if the change has been made. An important one from an OEM perspective is parts configuration. So if you look, if a modif MUP is modified and we're not aware of the modification of a MUP, there is the potential partial demodification when we get asked for parts, we would provide an original part which could potentially unmodified part of a change. So a change that is safe could involve a hardware change and a software change. And we're asked to provide a new controller and then it reverts the software to an older standard. You now end up with a partially modified machine, which the safety of that is, is unknown. They also create the incorrect behavior as well. So the, the latter example. And that is typically an identification that the incorrect new has been selected for the task. It's important to understand the consequence on product liability and where that liability sits. And it's really important as a manufacturer, as a uh, modifier and as an owner of the new to understand where that liability lies when you create a modification to a new. From a secondary perspective, notifying the OEM enables us to identify whether there is already an approved option or accessory available that can meet the needs of the original desire and the original um, change of, of scope. Um, or there may be a more appropriate mute for the task that's been requested. But ultimately, two key takeaways, um, three key takeaways. It's the owner and the user's responsibility to maintain a safe and compliant mute, and that includes its configuration. We recommend that owners consult the OEMs regarding any third party modifications to the point that are listed above. And then finally, from a user's perspective, if you're unsure when, of a modification on a mute that you're using and there's no documentation to support it and there's no clear justification or approval documentation in the manual box, contact the owner. Don't presume it to be okay, as Tony mentioned. It's really important that you, you highlight it to the owner of the mute. 
they were my three important takeaways as a as a manufacturer. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the presentations, and I'll hand back to you, Brian. Thank you, Jim, um, and thanks for showing that from the manufacturer's perspective. It's really great to uh, you know to hear some of them thoughts from you. I appreciate you do speak for the whole of the for the for the, uh, the manufacturers. Um, don't forget, folks, you can actually uh, ask your questions. Um, and there is a question uh, tab that you can ask. So we're having some questions coming through, and we'll endeavour to to speak about and discuss these later on. Okay, so now we'll hear from a rental company's perspective. I'm going to hand over to you now, Rob. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Rob Cavallari. I'm the Regional Safety Training and Compliance Manager for Man Manlet Middle East. And my presentation today is focusing on um, the modifications from a rental organization perspective. How do we see modifications on machines in the rental cycle? So I'm gonna use the definition um, of modification you've heard already. So any change or changes to a mobile elevating work platform that affects the operation or the safety factors, rated load or the safety of the MUP in any way. So that's my definition that I'm, I'm gonna be using today. Just put my highlighter up there. So I'd like to just remind everybody that um, there's different levels of modifications, different types of modifications and they occur in different areas. And Necessity is the mother of invention and modifications will frequently come from ideas based on the need. And I'd like to quote a recent quote from Craig Edwards from JLG, the Vice President of National Accounts, when talking about the new self-leveling 670 SJ. Um, and he was saying that, you know, companies, customer inspired innovation. And when you open the curtain a little around our design and our product development process, you find many ideas that result directly from customer input, and that includes in the field. Now, of course, the devil is in the detail, and we have to make sure that if there are modifications taking place, they're done in the correct manner, and there's good and there's not good modifications. So why do modifications take place? And here's some of the reasons why. I'll modify a mute when the mute doesn't do what the user wants it to do. I will modify to improve the mute. This may be related to reliability, costs of ownership, or safe use. I will modify, and it's then sometimes straightforward abuse, damage, and unsafe use. I will modify to resolve a recurring new model specific issue. Sometimes the mute might have a technical or operational issue, and then technical people will attempt to resolve that issue. I will modify when the OEM has no available solution or it's cost prohibitive or I'll modify when the OEM solution cannot be supplied in time. I will modify when the MUP is not the correct model for the intended task. And sometimes I'll just modify the MUP to, to make cash. So here's some of the reasons why we see modifications taking place. Now, remembering I'm giving a perspective from the rental organization, this wheel on the right-hand side you can see here represents a rental cycle. And you can see here, um, I've got the bottom half of the circle underneath the yellow line, which represents the off-ramp part of a MUP. And then the top part of the circle above the yellow line represents the on-ramp part. So let's look at some of the modifications that take place and the types um, here. Now in the rental cycle, um, we have modifications taking place when MUPs are unloaded inbound on the delivery vehicles. And type D relates to damage and equipment abuse. And we can have type F taking place sometimes in the workshop we might, or in the yard, we might have type F taking place, which is competency related. We might have a mechanic or a technician modifying the MUP unintentionally because they haven't had the required training instruction. And maybe they're installing a part or adjusting a component or changing something on the MUP without understanding the implications. And also in the workshop, we will do type A modifications. These are OEM approved modifications. Type B modifications, these are, consist of rental company and third party approved modifications. And type C can also take place in the workshop of a rental organization. And type C is adding accessories or options. And now they may, might be from the OEM or they could be from approved third parties. 
Now, what happens on the on-rent part of modifications with the rental organisation? Again, we have type D when the MUPs are loaded and they're out, outbound on the delivery vehicles. And here's where on rent. So when the MUPs are actually being used by operators, here's where rental organisations have to deal with a lot of modifications taking place. Type E, type E modifications are intended and unintended modifications by the end users and type D, damage and equipment abuse. This is what we're dealing with on a, on a regular basis in a rental organisation. Okay, here's a slide representing the different levels of modification. You can see picture here number one and picture number two. These represent quite elaborate modifications. You can see here a swinging stage or a gondola um, with cable climbing hoist suspended from a telescopic boom lift. And this one below here, the diesel power unit has been removed and has been replaced with um, DC battery power unit. And, and these more elaborate modifications when undertaken by professional and reputable organisations, they're done in the correct manner. That means there's independent engineers who have experience in this, there's a build specification done, there's testing done, and then the MUPs are checked that they still conform to the standard by which they were built. And recertification takes place also in these types of modifications. And we have these more simple ones, number three here. This is a third party supplied drop object protection system. And there's some issues with that you'll see later related to wind rating, so on and so forth. And then we have more simple modifications, number four, where in the workshop or on, in the field, a switch might be replaced. It may be a substandard component. It may, may not have an IP rating or dust or water ingress. And this can actually cause a malfunction. So a significant issue um, from replacing components like this small switch can actually have a serious implication. We need to be aware of that. And also fitting fire extinguishers to baskets of mutes. You know, we just have a, a weight increase there as well. We have to factor that in, but also it becomes a drop object hazard. And MUPS aren't fire engines. We'll discuss that more later. So all these types of modifications can be done well or not. However, even number four can result in an incident or accident. So here's some examples of OEM um, modifications that are available or accessories, we might call them. Pipe rack systems, number one, smaller cages. Here's a boom cage, which is reduced in size. We have alternative tyres. Here's a, an example of an OEM supplied solid tyre with cavities for cushioning as well to the right compression value. Here's a, a boom lip, which has got a glass lifting attachment, electromechanical attachment um, mounted to it. And here, number five, we have alternative fall protection systems for a, um, a boom lift basket, and even a simple tool tray, which we've seen already in the presentations. Um, this is an OEM supplied tool tray there. So these are supplied. Now, type B examples are examples that be, can be supplied from a rental organisation also, or third party. And it all depends on how well they're done, how professional is the organisation, and what are they testing the modification to? For example, a common example in a rental organisation is, is solid tyres and tyre lamination. So things that need to be considered is a gerometer rating, how hard, what's the hardness of the tyre compound? Is it equate to exactly what the manufacturer specifies? What's the width of the tyre, the depth of the tyre? <clears throat> All these things need to be factored in. And if they meet the specification, they can be done safely. Number two, simple things like lights can be done in a safe manner. Okay, if a third party is doing this or the rental organisation, um, they'll be thinking about things like the mounting method, is it safe? Is it caught creating a, a, a cut hazard for the end user? The wiring, the drain on the battery, can the alternator cope with the drain, for example? You know, so these type of things need to be factored in. And here's the drop object protection system again for a boom lift, third party supply. Now, has there been a, a consideration of the D rating for the wind load, if it's applicable, or is it still the same? Is it still 12.5 minutes per second? And there's also a snag hazard and additional training and instruction required when you're applying these modifications. And a rental organisation that's reputable will factor these things in. And here's a, another example of a quite an elaborate modification, a special platform. The same design approval process would need to be taken place for this one. You know, what's the, the, the platform capacity? What's the wind rating changes? What's the training and instruction requirements? What about loading and unloading? How do we manage the significant um, um, potential for damage for this platform when it's being loaded or used on site. Here's some more examples from rental organisations or third party approved 
These can be done in a very safe manner with the correct approvals here. You can see pipe racking systems, you know, have the, 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 the has the load of the mobile elevating work platform been reduced as required? Is the wind rating reduced? Is there the correct information, safety decals? What's the training and instruction, you know, on, on the usage required? to be done, done in a safe manner. The one on the right-hand side, number two, a little bit more elaborate. This is an old picture of a Sigma lift, a platform extension, you know, and again, I would question whether that's safe and, com and conforms um, to any of the standard to which the mute was built. Maybe it's got height limit now, so it won't go to maximum height. The safe working load might have been reduced, so on and so forth, but we're not sure. It needs to be done in a safe manner. So here's examples of type A, B, C, A, B, E, and F examples. So type the F one here is a poorly fueled or wrong product use in the, in the tire. So this foam filled tire or polyurethane filled tire, and this can happen from manufacturer level or third party level. It hasn't been mixed correctly, it hasn't cured correctly, you know, or perhaps there's a competency issue with the provider and that can cause a stability hazard, okay? If it wasn't done correctly. And picture number two here um, also represents an issue. Um, the, what's called the lug void ratio is too wide here. And this can also affect the machine stability. It also mean r &M cost because it's gonna wear quicker this tire as well. So those type of things can be overlooked. And here's a repair of a tire, a repair of a urethane tire. Why? It's because site safety committees um, get very nervous when they see um, holes and cuts and gashes in tires. And, and you know, they may not be aware um, of, of the foam field tires capabilities and, and, you know, and, and its actual strength and uh, ruggedness. But um, unfortunately, repairing tires like this can hide damage. And the issue there is we can't see if damage is propagating under the repair. So it can be enough safe practice. And there's a lot of work to be done here with the OEMs and the rental companies to make sure this is a more smooth um, um, issue as far as tires are concerned. Here's a correctly filled tire. Um, done by a third party, has used the correct product inside, filled to the correct pressure. It's the correct tire, load rating, ply rating, width, and wall height. So there's no reason that why that can't be done in a safe manner by a rental organization or a third party as well. Um, here we have examples of perhaps um, lack of competency. There's been a damage to a scissor weldment here. And you can see here, someone's going to attempt to replace that. And even if they're using um, a competent welder with the right qualifications and the correct welding rods, the actual structural integrity of the, the scissor lift could be compromised and really that weldment should be replaced. There's those type of issues. This happens a lot of on, on site. We see end users fitting plastic around the basket of the boom lift platform or the scissor lift platform. This is usually when someone's welding in the basket to unblock welding flash or it's also used as dropped object protection. And again, the main issue there is what, have they affected the wind speed rating of that MUP? And also there are things like visibility, vis visibility for the operator. They, maybe they can't see um, where they're mobile and the MUP all the ways as well. So that's something that needs to be considered happening on site. Here's some um, not too uncommon examples. Um, you can see here um, type E unintended and intended modification, picture one, you know, what's, what's happening here? We're putting lights on the scissor lift. Um, is the wind speed affected? Yes. Um, is, the, is the weight bearing down on the platform? No. Is it evenly distributed? No. You know, what are the stability um, factors for the, the scissor lift now? So, you know, that's, that's a bit of a worry when we see that. And the same for this second picture here, scaffolding attached to the outside of the boom lift um, with a large camera there. You know, what, what, how is the stability factor? What's the drop object hazard like? Um, and we have additional wind hazard here with the umbrella, which we've seen before. This happens on site um, without the rental organizations um, being aware. Here is the fire extinguisher in picture two. Okay, it, it weighs an extra 6.5 kilograms, but you know that's not the only issue there that has to be factored in. It's a drop object hazard. It hasn't been mounted correctly. And you know, to be honest with you, Fires generally don't happen in the basket. They're going to happen down on the ground level. Um, so, you know, and, you know, what's the product inside? How do we know it's going to be working for the fire that starts, the type of fire, and who's got the maintenance program for that fire extinguisher? Maybe those things weren't considered when we put that fire extinguisher in the basket. Here we have some examples that were discussed before. 
MUPs on site will frequently have guardrails lowered or removed. Then the bolts that go back inside aren't high tensile or they don't have lock nuts. And that's a fall hazard for the operators. Um, I'm, the same hazard can present with original supplied quick pins. I'm not a fan of these quick pins. They seize and they don't get put back in correctly. Um, and these quick pins here, which we see in handrails too often, this is how they're left on site. The operators, because these springs get tired or they don't go back in. So they're not a good idea in the rental fleets. And, and, and the best solution there is the correct high tensile bolt with a lock nut. Here we can see a modified battery. So these two batteries, one is a cranking battery, one is an emergency lowering battery. Someone has replaced the emergency lowering battery with a lower capacity or lesser capacity. So can, in an emergency, the emergency functions of this, the auxiliary power on this boom lift, can it get the person down in an emergency or will you lose power and what will that result in? So we should never change batteries on a MUP um, with the lesser capacity batteries during maintenance or on site. Here's an example of that simple switch you can see here, which can cause a malfunction. This can happen due to lack of confidence or on site. Here's some damage which had been repaired, but actually the issue here is to this cage, its structural capacity has been compromised. So it's not just they plugged the hole here, that cage could fail as a result. Here's one that happens sometimes, you can see a picture of a fuse. So a, a larger fuse, a 30 amp fuse in this case has been replaced instead of should have been a 20 amp. This can melt wires and can start a fire. So that's a significant modification we might not think of. This can happen sometimes on sites. Here's some examples of some good simple modifications. Here we have um, something that's done by rental companies perhaps or third parties, just simply um, contrasting colors for scissor safety braces. So the rental company did that ahead of um, the OEMs. And here's um, a before and these two pictures and here's an after by mounting an, uh, an inlet on a mute in a positive manner, you're reducing electrocution hazard chance, um, you're reducing breakdowns so, and tri slip trip hazards as well. So here's some, a couple of examples of good modifications, simple ones. And my last slide, I'd like to talk about some of the countermeasures for detrimental um, modifications. What are some of the things we can do? So I'll read these out. Uh, continue to increase confidence of new operators, understanding the risks by continued promotion and uptake of power to access license. That's one of the best things we can do. Bring awareness to more construction companies, subcontractors, project managers, foremen and site safety representatives. Uh, and, um, and for example, we can do on-site safety days, a MUP for managers from IPAP is a great course and open house days to increase awareness. Number three, um, continue to increase confidence of workshop and field technicians by a more frequent OEM technician mechanic competency technical training, um, including skills evaluation and technical grading guides. And number four, mandate competency evaluations for third party inspection engineers. We have a lot of inspection organisations where they don't have the required training and instruction and therefore they're not really sure on what they're testing and is a MUP okay to use. Number five, more frequent continued professional development for IPAP instructors. Number six, more frequent audits for IPAP training centres. Number seven, delivering IPAP curriculums to countries covering training and apprenticeship pathways for service technicians and engineers. Number eight, something that IPAP does well, lobbying governments and relevant authorities to implement best practice and apply recognised solutions. Number nine, harsher penalties and repercussions for modifications made to MUPs whilst in use on rent. Number 10, more relaxed endorsement, perhaps by OEMs, of good solutions and accessories added to MUPs provided by competent third party organisations. And number 11, reduce operator licence validity to two years instead of five years. Thank you much. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, thank you, Rob. Um, I'm sure some of their modifications have caused your businesses and others probably a few headaches in the past. I know from having been in rental companies myself, having seen some of their modifications, and you know that that does raise a few questions, and I'm sure it does uh, does cause a lot of people concerns. Great. Okay, now we'll hear from TJ uh, Lyons from a uh, users and contractors perspective. TJ, over to you. Good. Thank you, Brian. How are we doing on time, Brian? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for the opportunity here. And I, I just wanted to kind of remind everyone, 
either an iPad for who uses sizzle lifts. Um, you know, years ago, I came up with the idea of ladders last 2011. And there's been a lot of lives saved by what, what the people on this call have been involved with, either engineering or use of lifts. And I just wanted to make sure everyone understands the, the value of what we're talking about here. Right? So uh, I want to talk about particularly um, some of the things I've seen in the field um, regarding lifts, some feedback opportunities, et cetera, that I think is important from the user's perspective, right? So we, I've seen lifts all over the United States and overseas for many years and had a chance to compare what I see in the field. And uh, I think we can do a little bit better. And uh, next slide, please. So one of the things I, I look for um, on the lift, right, is when you see somebody making a, a modification, there's a reason for it, right? I grew up on a dairy farm and we used to make things better because it was easier for us. And one of the things I wanna talk about in particular is, you know, looking at the lifts that we're using to get some, some indicators or symptoms of how we can make them better. Um, and also working with the manufacturers. I've had some great success with a couple of manufacturers on feedback from the field that they've incorporated uh, into the next set of, uh, of lifts. I'm very happy about that. Uh, but also some of the things that I see in the field that need to be kind of highlighted, uh, many may not be aware of that um, I wanted to share today. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. This is a great example, right? So when you look at something in the field and it's been fabricated to make it work, right? then you might as well say the original design was a failure. And I think we need to be a little more honest here. I've seen garbage bags, plastic bags, et cetera, used under lifts to kind of serve as a diaper. Very rarely, by the way, I've ever seen a lift uh, leak. But it's something that we really need to look for in the field. And when you see something fabricated or modified, and there's been some great examples, uh, the industry, I think, needs to recognize that that's because there's a need from the user, right? Here's what I want to do. I'm going to try to change it myself. But man, it would be great if the uh, manufacturer incorporated those designs into the next generation, which I think is a big part of my presentation, which I hope kind of comes across here. Uh, next slide, please. And this is this is like one of my favorite stories. So I probably looked at three, five, seven hundred sizzles in my my life, and um, almost every one of them, these little outlets on the floor are damaged or broken or destroyed uh, because people step on them. Right? It's human nature. You want to get a couple more inches up there, you're going to step on the the cover of this and it's going to fail. I would say if I've seen 600 lifts and looked at these outlets, probably 80% of them, the outlet was, was destroyed. It wasn't until a few years ago that they started putting um, a little steel or aluminum tab on the top of it so you could actually step <laughs> on the tab, right? Versus moving the outlet to an area where you weren't going to be uh, impacting it with your feet. And when I see something like this and feel, I want to find a way to get back to the, um, the manufacturers on on this, this is actually a failure, probably unrecognized, but uh, we've always done it this way is one of the things that kind of bothers me in, in the world of safety. And I think it's one of those indicators where, um, you know, in, quick feedback is important, but when you look at these units and see how they're used and where they're failing, that's probably the best lesson for any manufacturer on their next generation. Go ahead, thank you. Yeah, this is a, a concern of mine, right? This is a, an un unprotected chain and a sprocket on the lift that I've recognized for the last couple of years. And we're trying to work with some of the manufacturers now to find out. Now, this is an obvious hazard to a safety person. Uh, typically, these things are over seven feet out of the way. Um, but we actually had a case where a, a girl got her hand stuck in a sprocket up here. She was wearing gloves. And when something like this is, is noted in the field, and it's probably not very usual, not uncommon, though, um, I'm looking for some fairly quick response from the manufacturer on how we can fix this, right? And in this particular case, it's kind of a cumbersome answer on how to get this corrected and a little more later on that, but uh, there needs to be some sense of urgency from the manufacturers when something hazardous uh, is recognized in the field and that has to be addressed. Go ahead. So what happens in the field, and this goes back to the last speaker, is you know, we, we kind of make things up. <clears throat> how can we make this safer? So I grabbed this photograph and. Some of the vendors actually in Texas and New York are now supplying this uh, uh, a clear poly, poly plexiglass shield over the chain. But you'll see it doesn't go all the way to the top of the chain to provide some protection to the user. Is this a modification? Of course it is, right? And, uh, and it's something that really shouldn't have happened. Uh, this is a hazard in my opinion that was unrecognized. And now we're trying to fix it in the field by protecting the users. Uh, when in fact, this should be a pretty high priority for the manufacturer to make these these corrections across the board, right? And I realize there's tens of thousands of these things in the field. 
um, but it's still a hazard that exists to every user that at some point we need to figure it out. So again, back to you know, the symptom, when you see somebody fabricating something in the field to make it better or safer, that's a really big opportunity and a gift uh, to the manufacturer to design out that hazard, right? So the whole idea of prevention to design, something I'm a, a huge fan of, uh, is coming up. You'll see it fixed in a few minutes. That few minutes that may take care of this exposure, but um, it really does require looking, listening to users, and incorporating what we've learned into the next generation. So I spotted this one at an airport a couple of weeks ago, and you can see that the manufacturer put the the manuals and a a plate on the front of the chain here so that uh, you're not exposed to the chain or the sprocket. I believe the top of the sprocket is still um, available. Usually there's a little rubber cap on the top of this. It probably could be better, right? But this is a great step forward for someone who has recognized a hazard and at least incorporated protection into this, this type of lift. But again, there are probably 30 or 40,000 lifts across the US um, in this particular configuration that have the exposed sprocket in the chain that, that we really need to get corrected. But it's great to see progress in the field and you know, it takes baby steps. And, and I think this is one. Uh, go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> so I've certainly talked about the sprocket at length and the, and the chain exposure, but um, you know, two things kind of I wanted to talk about. Number one is when we go back to the electrical outlet, I probably looked again at three or 500 lifts, probably more than that. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone use that electrical outlet. Usually they run a cord, tie it to the railing and, and go up in the air and do their work. We also need to think about um, things that users may not be aware of, right? So this lift here was in the building and uh, went, went across the outside exposed area of the building and the wind was blowing and the wind blew the lift over and really, really broke the user. And uh, it's something that bothered me because I wasn't aware of it. This was probably 10 years ago, um, the effect of wind on a lift. And I started asking folks, almost everybody I know I ask on a lift now, you know, hey, I didn't know if you can use a lift in the wind or not. And probably 3% of the answer, people know that answer, which is very scary to me, but also a really big gift or opportunity for the industry. If the people using the, the lifts don't understand the effect of putting a, for example, a screen around the basket to keep the materials inside of it, or they don't even know that you shouldn't use a lift uh, that's designed inside outside, that's a very big, big challenge for the industry that I think needs to be addressed. And I think there's probably a series of five or 10 questions you can ask any lift user. You better know them all, or she. Uh, but if you only know one or two, uh, somehow we need to do two things. I think pick up the practice of sharing um, things that we learned. And here's a recognized hazard right now. A lot of folks don't know uh, the wind hazards of a lift. Getting back to the industry, getting back to the individual user. So he's aware of the hazard of using the, their, these lifts. Something I think we need to address. And, uh, from my perspective, extremely important. Or we'll still have lifts blowing over in the wind because people don't know they shouldn't be using them in the wind. And again, I, I had a, a great 10, 15 years ago, we had a brainstorm with my, my team in California. We came up with 22 uh, alterations or design modifications. We wanted the perfect sizzle lift to look like. And we actually brought them up to a manufacturer and sat down and talked to the design engineer and it was well received. There is no reason we can't gather a bunch of folks using our lifts, find out how they could be better, kind of listen to the people using them to find out what they actually need to do their job, and uh, kind of incorporate into those into the next design of lifts. Like I keep going back to when you see something like this in a in a SIS lift, it scares me. Number one, but number two, I recognize there's a failure somewhere along the line that the user had to incorporate this to get their to get their work done. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for that, CJ. Great insight from a from a contractor user's perspective, and I think that's um, hopefully um, um, rounded off really what is the issues for this in terms of the the industry. Um, we've had a number of questions through. One of the questions that I I would like to take first, um, and you, you still have got your opportunities uh, to ask, answer the questions, but um, a question from uh, John uh, John Berg. What is the standard with regards to netting around a mute basket for prevention of materials? So who, who would like to answer that question for me? I'm, I'm happy to step forward with that, Brian. Um, so I think it's a great question, and I think it's uh, something we see on a lot of machines. And I think, going back to the presentation that I gave, I think it's really important to understand there isn't a one-size 
fits all. So it's, such, it's, a, it's a top level question that doesn't have a top level answer. And I hate to say the word, it depends, but it depends. <laughs> and it would depend on a number of factors regarding the, the netting used, the weight of the netting, the thickness of the holes, the particular mute that it's on, the height it's going to, the length of the boom, if it's on a boom. All of these things have a part to play on how much of a factor the wind uh, rating change would would introduce and the consequence of that on the fundamental design and the and the envelope of the mute that, uh, that you're looking to put the, 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 the netting on. So it'd be very hard as a collective industry to say netting is okay um, because each design is different, each operation is different, each use is different and each netting is different. What you will find is there will be some manufacturers that have provided approval for nettings um, and it's, it's a case of understanding, again, we come back to our view, which is come and speak to us. There may already be an approval from the manufacturer of the meat that you have um, for netting on the particular um, model that you are looking to use. So again, it comes back to the, the objective of planning your task effectively, understanding the risks you're exposed to and understanding what questions you're asking when you are looking for the appropriate meat for the task. Because you may find that one of your questions into a rental company is, I need a particular mute with this capability, and there are so there are mutes available with approval to fit the netting from OEMs as well. So it, it's it's a very generic question that I don't think it has a generic answer to say. Well, there's a particular standard for netting because it will be different depending on um, the level of approval and the level of analysis and the the, the type of mute that the netting is fitted to. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that, um, and hopefully that's answered your question. Um, Why, Brian, I, I would just like to answer it through the uh, yeah. through a standard. The standards say that mutes shall not operate in wind speed conditions beyond the maximum allowed by the manufacturer. No modification or addition to the mute that affects its wind loading and consequently its stability shall be made without manufacturer's approval or a uh, and where the approval can't be attained by by an engineer. And uh, care shall be taken when handling building materials, sheeting materials, panels, or other such materials that can act as sales. So part of this also is, is what TJ said, which is awareness. If we have, uh, from, from TJ's perspective, only 3% of the population was aware of this, I, again, it comes down to uh, training, making sure that uh, that is by the operators and supervisors and users of the equipment. So. Uh, I think we need to apply all of those uh, applications. Thank you, Tony. Any other speakers got any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah, I just quickly, I might say something if I could. Um, I think, you know, in the real world, obviously, speed is, is of the essence, you know, and the machines are being on rent uh, and, and customers want a solution and, 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 and time is not there. And if there's no product available from the OEM, People will, we know what people will do something. That's why when you go to a site, you'll see, you know, hundreds of booms with plastic wrapped around it because people want a, a protection against dropped objects or they want to stop flat weld arc and so on and so forth. So I think there needs to be more. I don't think it's as simple as, as difficult as, as what we've heard. In my view, for example, this example, you can supply the detail of the netting, the, 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 the detail of the product you want to use it on with the model. And you can say, okay, we've tested with a third party engineer. This is how much it weighs. Please give me an approval, Mr. OEM. And I think it, it doesn't need to be as complex as sometimes it is. And the timeline certainly doesn't need to be as long. So I think there's compromise on both sides with that. Okay, thank you, Rob. Okay, we've got a question from Forrest. Um, what is OSHA's law on modifications? And will IPATH be educating today on OSHA's recent letter outlining their definition of the equivalent entity is significantly different from the one you provided? Tony, do you want to take that one? You're muted, Tony. You're on mute, You're on mute Tony. Thank you. Uh, so, so everyone is aware of it. Uh, an equivalent entity uh, it, it was added in addition to a manufacturer in the ANSI standards. And that is defined as an organization, agency, company, or individual who possesses an appropriate technical degree, certificate, professional standing, or skill, or who by knowledge, training, and or experience 
has demonstrated the ability to deal with the problems related to the subject matter, the work, or the project. Uh, Forrest uh, submitted uh, a letter of interpretation from OSHA on this subject, uh, and OSHA said that, uh, from their perspective, the only uh, appropriate entity that's equivalent to a manufacturer would be a uh, national testing laboratory. Uh, from 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 obviously from from the industry's perspective, that is uh, in, in in significant variation to uh, what uh, our definition is and what our expectation is. Kind of goes to what Rob was just saying a second ago, which is uh, you know there needs to be some level of, of uh, expediency to being able to resolve these issues, and you know to go over there and and you know so I, I guess I'm going to say we disagree with the interpretation of OSHA's uh, uh, response to what an equivalent entity is in, in our particular case. We define it differently within our standards. Uh, and we believe that uh, there are uh, uh, manufacturers of, of componentry that are uh, can, can provide equivalent uh, responses in, uh, in, in that regard. But I, I, but I would agree with Rob that, you know, I, I think that if we can get uh, the mute manufacturers to be more timely and responsive, uh, you know, that, that may uh, eliminate, you know, the need for uh, going to an equivalent entity as well. Thank you, Tom. Any other comments from other, any other panelists? So this is TJ. I've got, I've got one word of warning. Um, in the fall protection industry, we used to make provisions if an engineer designed a system it was safe to use. And uh, I once looked at a fall protection design system done by an engineer who had no idea what he was doing. Um, it was stamped and everything and ready to be put into play when in fact it was uh, inappropriate, should not be used. So just because a company has an engineer on their staff, they're going to be motivated to say to the engineer, hey, can you can you uh, sign off on this for me? And I think that's a danger we need to recognize. And I agree with Tony. Uh, it's got to be someone very experienced in a trade specific to the work that we're doing. Thank you, TJ. I'm going to take a question now from Jeff, and I think I can probably answer this being um, Head of Safety and Technical at IPATH, but it says, how many accidents are caused by a modification or a mod uh, is or perhaps was a contributing factor? Uh, easiest answer is, Jeff, we don't know. Um, there are, you know, many incidents and accidents reported through the IPATH accident portal, and you're all able to do that via your organisations or anonymously through the web or through the, 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 uh, the EPAL app. Um, but in, in truth, um, you know, often we look at the description of the incident to determine whether or not a modification was a contributing factor. Um, and it often sees it, often shows that that is not actually um, uh, described for us. So, you know, until we get more data on that, I'm afraid I can't really answer that one for you. Um, I've got a, some on the, um, the pre-register uh, for the webinar. Uh, some of you were kind enough to present your, your questions to us. Um, MUPs are mobile elevated working platforms. At what point does a MUPE become a crane when being used with a winch? Jim, what's your thoughts on that from a manufacturer, uh, from the from the um, from a manufacturer's perspective? Yeah, I think that's a again a great question, and um, uh, there's never an easy answer. But when you look at the standards across the globe for MUPs, there is a very clear definition that every single standard from ISO, from America, from Canada. Uh, Europe and Australia and other standards, they all focus around bringing people and their tooling and materials to height. That's the main objective of a MUP, and then all the standard is specifying how you accomplish that safely um, with, the, with the appropriate designs. When you, when you take the individual away from the MUP and you start to use it for um, just material handling, it, it, it can't meet the criteria of MUPs and you have to start to look to different standards for different parts of different industries. And there is challenges around when you go from being a MUP to being a crane to being a telehandler. Uh, when you look at the European aspects now, we're recognizing that and we have clarity or we're starting to introduce clarity across E into 80, where we're recognizing the use under part two of um, hoisting equipment to support an operator in the basket. So. Um, the standards continually evolve and we have um, experts across the industry, not just manufacturers, but we have iPath, we have users, we have um, uh, rental uh, companies and owners all on those standards committees. And we work hard to try and define the best standards looking forward. And while it's not the 
it's not a rapid response it is a progressive response and i think that kind of definition is being recognized in the standards as they evolve and i think the 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 imminent rollout of into 80 will, will recognize that in part one and part two thank you jim um i've got a question here from craig where do you stand on tool tetherboards that attach the guardrails like we saw the other week at the ipath professional development seminar who wants to take that question might be one yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Go on, yeah, go on, please. Yeah. yeah, so I always worry about unintended consequences, right? You start putting things on guardrails and you, you catch them on things as you go by. I think planning is more important than anything else. And, you know, sometimes simple is best as well. Um, if, if, there's, if there's no one around the lift and something falls, and that was part of the plan, you know, that's, that's acceptable as well. Tethering tools, I think, is critical in many areas, especially when people are working in close confines or you're on sensitive equipment. Um, but in my, my professional opinion, any tool tether should be as close to the person as possible. And I really wouldn't attach it to anything that's moving. That's like, tying, that's like tying something to the side of your pickup truck and driving down the highway. No, no good will come from that. So I think it requires planning. But you know, one thing I, I look at very closely is some of the new tools that we have, the battery operated tools are very um, condensed, easy to use, not very large. So again, if we keep it close to the user, and don't rely on the lift as far as the anchorage, I think we're probably in a better shape. Thank you, TJ. Does anybody else have any other thoughts on that? Oh, I think that's a great response from TJ. Yeah, fully support it. Thank you. You know, the, 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 the railing for primary purpose is to protect and keep the operator in the platform. That is the primary purpose of the railing. So yeah, yeah. I agree with TJ. Okay, I've got an anonymous question here. Um, should boom type mutes be modified and used with external hanging lighting stroke screening and gantry for film work. I think perhaps Rob, you uh, you showed some great photographs of uh, of that. What's your thoughts on them? Um, if it's done in the right way is my thoughts on that. Um, and, and quite often or invariably it's not done in the right way. There's a lot of things to consider, wind speed, the loadings, where the load's been taken from, um, you know, even safe access and egress, dropped objects. Um, so, it can be done in a safe manner, but you know it really need you need to um, have competent people making that decision. The risk assessment needs to be sound by a competent competent person um, with countermeasures put in place, and then no issues. We're measuring wind speed continuously at height, for example, is one of those things. But uh, yeah, so it's I think it's a bit like it's been said already. Um, no simple answer, but if you've got the right people looking at it, um, then you can make it. It can be done safely, which is what I would say. Otherwise, no. Okay, thank you. I've got a, a couple of questions here from Forrest. Um, I think I'll take that second one. How, how can third parties fill the gap when an OEM are slow to respond or to refuse to provide a solution or response to a user's question? Um, who would like to take that one for me? I'll, I'll have a quick step um, to start with. So we'll use third parties. I mean, simply the, you know, the, uh, uh, whether the OEMs have the um, capability or capacity to, to assist, maybe they're just unable to uh, in a timely manner. And, and, and we operate in a, in a business where you have to respond quickly, right? So we will use resources available to us um, if they can get us the same end goal, end result. However, it's incumbent on us um, as a professional organisation to make sure we vet that third party and make sure we understand, we do a supplier evaluation um, like you mentioned before, Brian, you know, do they have the ex required experience? Um, and if not, and then you have to go somewhere else and find someone because um, there's not there's many good engineering companies, but also there's some uh, questionable or disreputable ones out there. So you have to have to um, do your supplier evaluation. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right because you have to plan for these things. Unfortunately, what I used to find was that I want it for tomorrow, and you know. Quite honestly, that's not going to work. You need to plan these in advance and think about if you have got, you know, an issue that you wish to uh, to to address, and not expect the manufacturers to be able to respond because you know they are perhaps probably inundated with with these requests. Equally, then when you go to a third party, that can that can have uh, you know huge huge issues. Okay, um, I there's a few questions coming in, um, and one thing I will take here is I think. Does, does one need to stick to the original battery make as supplied by the OEM or changing batteries make would be considered as a modification? Uh, and that one's from Siddhartha. So if, um, if anybody would like to answer that for me, please. 
Jim? I'm, yeah, I can do that. Um, you know, we've already seen a, a picture of an example where uh, a battery change can, is considered a modification because you haven't considered the weight, uh, the center of gravity, the capacity and the volume. So um, again, no simple answer. There are um, battery modifications that are modifications that shouldn't be done. Um, some manufacturers can provide approval to say that if you provide the right um, uh, ampage, current wattage, size, weight, then you can provide like for like from a different manufacturer. But again, always recommend getting that approval and getting the, the, the advice. Um, a lot of manufacturers do provide that guidance on fit, form and function. If they are, uh, again, touching on Tony's point, if, if the replacement part is identical, I can't remember the two words that you use, Tony, but identical and exact, then, then it's not considered uh, a modification. But we saw some very clear examples of batteries being used that were not um, fit form and function uh, identical so they they would be constituted as modifications and uh, and unless they've been pre-approved that that is an, an approved modification okay um great answer there and thank you for that jim do really appreciate that um so we have run out of time now um i've seen quite a few questions asking if this webinar is going to be available and the answer is yes it will be available on the ipad website and also on our youtube channel typically available a couple of days after after this is sort of concluded um also as well you may have seen from the holding slides uh, at the start of the webinar we have a brand new individual membership available in ipath and that's the category of the ipath safety professional um we're seeing you know a good number of people now um register for an individual uh, uh, membership of this category and this ensures that they have the necessary information and guidance at their disposal to ensure that powered access is used safely in their business and, their, and sector. So, so please do consider this. We're kind of mindful that sometimes you, you're out there, you've got that many hats that you want to wear in terms of safety and, and your organizations and, and just having that information at your fingertips may help you, know, you in, in, in doing your job uh, and hopefully preventing any incidents. So um, to conclude the webinar, can I say a really big thank you to Jim, Rob, TJ and Tony. I think they've done an excellent job today. Uh, discussing this subject it is a, it is a very you know uh, contentious subject i think they've done extremely well so thank you very much to to all of you uh, and also i'd like of course to thank our sponsors skyjack and hinawa um because without them it really you know we, we do struggle to do these webinars but lastly and of course i'd like to thank you all today for joining us today it really does make it worthwhile and the interaction with some of the questions um the next ipath webinar is now open for registrations and that will be on electrification I'll say that again, electrification of powered access, which will be held on the 19th of January 2022. Goodness me, where's this year gone? So please do look at the events page on the website and have a, have a look at that and, and, and do register for that. And lastly, I'd like to wish everyone season's greetings to you and your families. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>